Hello there, friends. Welcome again to Grace Baptist Church. This is our Wednesday night Bible study. We're glad you're tuned in. And this is Wednesday evening, July the 7th. Hope you had a good July the 4th. And we're going to be back in the book of Proverbs tonight, studying these wonderful principles that help us live our life for the Lord. Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 10. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. And let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get into the passage. Father, we come tonight thanking you for the time we have. So good to be able to share the Bible. I pray for each one listening, God, that it will change all of our lives as we listen to the word and learn from it, apply it into our life, Help us to be more like our Savior, Jesus. And Father, help us to be on the lookout for those who might need a helping hand, for those who may need the Savior, who is Jesus. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, we know that a man who hates to be told what to do is wrong. That's what the Bible's saying. There's a lot of people they will not accept any advice, any admonition, God's discipline, God's correction is hard and detestable to those who have gotten off the path of God. They feel like, hey, I've got this clicking. I don't need the Lord's help. And they hate it when God has to chase them. But God knows how to get our attention, doesn't he? He knows how to take us behind the old woodshed. The righteous person realizes that God only corrects us because he loves us. He wants what is best for us. And sometimes, as I said, he carries us behind the woodshed to teach us some lessons in life. We have to go through some trials, some burden, some heartache. That person who hates the correction and the discipline of God will be destroyed prematurely. And that's what it says there. He that hateth reproof shall die. So friends, don't ever think God's up there trying to just whack you over the head with a big stick. No, he loves you. He's trying to work with you to keep you on the right path. Those who go down the wrong road are on the path of hell and destruction and death, and they don't even realize it. Jesus said, broad is the way to destruction, but narrow is the way to eternal life. And when you think about John chapter 14, verse 6, I'll tell you how narrow it really is. Jesus said, he said in that passage that if we didn't trust him as our Savior, then we could not go to heaven. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And that excludes a whole lot of other ways. Sometimes people talk about going to heaven by being baptized, going to heaven by being a church member. Some say, I'm a good person, I know I'm going to make it into heaven. And those are all great qualities to have. But it'll never wash your sin away. Only the blood of Jesus can wash sin away. And so when you come to Christ and you're saved, then you're on your way to heaven because he is the only one who can save us. Verse 11 here, hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Now this is talking about the omnipotence of God. The omnipotence omniscience of God. He knows all. He sees all. With God, nothing is impossible. You could go right into the pits of hell and death and God still sees what's going on. There's nothing hid from the eyes of God. He sees that far into the judgment of the lost. That's what the verse is saying. So surely he can see what we're doing today. Surely he knows what we're thinking today. We keep our thoughts on the Lord because our thoughts are very important. 
For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, verse number 7. Our thoughts are usually what begins a process of growing closer to the Lord, to be more like him, or to backslide on the Lord and go away from him. It usually starts with the thoughts. I don't think there's that many people that just all of a sudden backslide. I think it's a gradual process most of the time. And uh, this person thinks about something for so long and so long, and then finally they decide they're going to try it out. And always remember, that heart, that heart can get you in trouble if it's not based upon what God wants and what God says. It can be evil, can be deceitful. So he says in Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart. Keep it, guard it with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of life. Hell is a real place where unbelievers spend all eternity. But God knows all about it. And he never created hell for man, but for Satan and for all of his demons. But when a person refuses the Lord's offer of salvation, they end up sending themselves to hell. Come to the Lord this evening, friends. It's the best decision you could ever make. Come to Christ. Then verse 13. I'm sorry, verse 12. We're back in Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 12. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him. <laughs> Neither will he go unto the wise. This is the person who thinks they know everything. They cannot be taught a thing. He or she mocks and ridicules the wise person who may be trying to help them in their time of need. He would never go to a wise person for godly counsel. Why? He's too proud for that. He doesn't want to admit that he might need a word of advice. He doesn't want to admit that he needs some counsel from time to time. Boy, I'll be the first one to admit I love to hear good godly counsel. When people tell me things I don't know. Every person can be your teacher if you know the right questions to ask. Because everybody knows something you don't know. And you can learn from everyone. So the word for scorner talks about a scorner loveth not one that reproveth him. That's an interesting word. Scorner. You only find it basically in the Bible, but what does it mean? Well, it's a primitive root word. It means to make mouth say it, to scoff. Kind of like to stick your tongue out at someone, to scorn at them, to mock them. Could you reflect back in your life and remember those in the classroom who love to cut up and they always wanted to be the class clown. And they wanted the attention from everybody in the classroom. And the teacher may or may not have put up with their foolishness. But everybody who was serious about learning was glad when the teacher finally rebuked the scorner. And I can remember I had a teacher in college. He was an ex-Marine. You didn't mess with him. And he was a great teacher. But he's also a great teacher disciplinarian too because we had a smart acting fellow in the class who always tried to get the attention and make the teacher look bad and one day the teacher had had all he could take and boy he put him in his place he calmed him down real quick and he said you're here for one reason and that's to train for the ministry this is a bible college so why Give us all this trouble, and why I always have to be the class clown? If you're studying to be in the ministry, it's a serious business. Souls are hanging in the balance. There are people who need you. So be serious. And, and you know what? It worked. That boy changed his attitude. He became a great worker for the Lord. So, anyway, when we look in see those who are 
cutting up and those who are trying to get the attention and those who are messing the whole class up for everybody else. <laughs> what a wonderful time it is when you have somebody who knows how to reprove that person and put them in their place so everybody else can take advantage of what they're supposed to be learning. Sometimes you have to go to the troublemaker. You remember old Barney on Andy Griffith? And he'd tell Andy, nip it in the bud. Nip it in the bud, Andy. <laughs> it's not fair for one or two to disrupt a whole class or a family or a business or even a church. Somebody needs to reprove them. Somebody, the pastor, the deacons, or some authoritative figure needs to go to this person and say, hey, we can't allow you to disrupt the whole church and get everyone mad or to turn people against each other. God hates those who sow discord in the church. And so a primitive word to be right, it means to justify, to argue, to chasten, to convince. That's what he's talking about here when we talk about to reprove a person. As Andy said, nip it in the bud. Go to them. Reprove them. Show them the error of their what? Do it in love. We're, we're all sinners. Uh, we're not better than they are. They're not better than we are. But sometimes we all need some corrective criticism to reprove us and help us in our ways with the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. It's done in the right spirit with love. Speaking the truth with love, that's what the Bible talks about. Listen to what Paul said. He had the same idea back over in Thessalonians to the church of Thessalonica. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and be patient toward all men. The word for warn, when he says warn those who are unruly, that carries the idea to use caution, but reprove gently, to admonish and warn them. Now the word for unruly means disorderly, out of ranks, like the soldiers who are out of ranks with the troops. It talks about those who are deviating from the prescriptive order of service. There are some who need correction. Why? Because they are disorderly. They are out of step with everybody else. And they're even out of step with the Lord. So one rotten apple can spoil the whole bunch if we allow it. Don't be afraid to go to a person with meekness, boldness, to help them see the error of their way so they can learn and grow and be more like Jesus and everybody else can. So that's what we're talking about here. God will always take care of you when you do it with the right spirit. We don't go to them and look down upon them and, you know, rebuke them as if we're perfect and they're terrible. No, we go to them with a loving heart and explain to them Hey, we're here to learn. We're here to grow. We want everybody to be able to hear what God has to say. Verse number 13. Notice what we find now when we go back into our text here. Proverbs 15, verse number 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. <laughs> and it's a proven fact. Laughter is and good cheer and joy always adds to a person's life. Health, length of life. I mean, they bring to life a wonderful dimension that cannot be there if we live in sorrow and pessimism. So you may be thinking that I am a little extreme. I'm, I've had that told to me from people from time to time. Preacher use a lot of humor. Why in the world you do? You know why I do that? Because people are hurting. And people need to laugh. And people need to smile. And people need to have the joy of the Lord. And 
It helps me preach better. It kind of relaxes everybody when you use a little bit of humor. I mean, think about it. <laughs> when you watch something that makes you laugh, it makes you feel a lot better, doesn't it? When you smile, you look a whole lot better. <laughs> I could watch Laurel and Hardy. You remember old Laurel and Hardy? I used to have the movies. I'd watch them when I was in a bad mood. You know what? It always seemed to pick me back up. Just watch them. and They were always funny. Slapstick humor, but funny. When a person's full of the Lord, it's going to show up on their face. And you can't hide something as wonderful as knowing the God of the universe. I mean, there is power in a merry heart. It's like a medicine. It reflects itself in the outward appearance of that person. Have you ever seen somebody who just has the glow of God on them? You can tell they walk with God. They spend time with God. But a person who is broken hearted, they display that pain and that anguish. You can see it on their hearts too. So we need to come along beside them. Be cheerful. Smile. Try to encourage that person. Hey, everything's going to work out. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is still on the throne. I mean, think about it. And we constantly have to be on the lookout for, for ourselves wearing a frown. We don't want to go around with the world thinking we're miserable because we're Christians. We want to go around wearing a smile, letting the world know that, hey, I've got the joy of the Lord in my heart. He loves me. He cares for me. And then we'll finish it up with verse number 14. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. This is referring to those who are wise with just some good old common sense. They continue to learn throughout life. They may not have a college degree, but they are very, very smart. I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. There's a lot of people brag about having a Ph.D., <laughs> a Ph.D. Well, to me, that doesn't mean a whole lot, post hole digger. <laughs> I mean, so a person can dig a post hole. Now, I know what it really means, doctor of philosophy. But I know some people that have some good old common sense that didn't even finish grade school, but they love God. And they've got the wisdom of God, and I can learn from these people. What God has taught them, they can teach us. So continue to learn throughout life. And don't be like the foolish person and waste your life. The mind is like a computer. You have to keep it active or you'll lose what little that we really have. <laughs> and I don't have enough to lose. Don't let cobwebs grow up here. The wise person has a habit. Always continually improve. Always continually learn more and more in life. We'll never learn it all, but we can continue to learn more. The foolish person's content to sit back and think and talk about nothing. So we must feed our minds on the word of God, on that which is important, just like we feed our bodies. And the kinds of books that we read and the people that we talk to and the music we listen to and the films we watch, they're all a part of our mental diet. So be discerning because what you put in the mind influences your total health and well-being. And so there's a strong desire to discover a knowledge and the mark of wisdom is that person who seeks the Lord. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll pick it back up at verse number 15 next week, but I hope you have a great evening. Come see us this week at Grace Baptist. We're located just south of Greensboro, 435 NC Highway 62 West, and we'll have our service this Sunday at 10 o'clock. We'd love to have you. Let us pray. Father, thank you again that we can be together and learn and grow, to know the Word of God, to learn from those who are smarter than us, to learn from those 
who could teach us things. Lord, help us never be content where we are in our Christian growth, but to always have a burden to grow more every day, to be more like our Savior Jesus. If there's somebody listening who's never been saved, I pray for them. God, that they will make that decision and come to the Lord, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you for tuning in on this Wednesday afternoon.